conservative activist Larry Clayman uh, and the ACLU have also filed similar lawsuits against the NSA and both resulted in either failure or a stayed ruling. Uh, what makes you think that you'll have any more success than these groups that have tried before you? I am supportive of all the other lawsuits, so it isn't exclusive that mine is the best, but it is slightly different. The ACLU lawsuit was ruled against. The judge either threw it out or said that the program was constitutional. The claimant suit is in the same court that, my, that mine will go to, and the uh, judges previously ruled it unconstitutional, stayed the ruling, and I think it will be appealed. So I think the claimant suit is still active. Ours is going to the same court because it has a similar subject. Our case is slightly different, and we think for some legal reasons uh, that it may have a chance of going all the way to the Supreme Court. To me, it's not so much that my case has to go, but I think a case needs to go to the Supreme Court because currently many people believe that the Fourth Amendment doesn't apply at all. They think that the reason why you can give a single warrant to Verizon is that you don't own those, those records. I think they're jointly held. I think if you sign a privacy agreement, Verizon agrees not to tell your neighbor who you're calling. So they kind of acknowledge that. I think it's acknowledging that you still have an interest in those records. But to me, the most important thing is, and there's at least, we think, four or five Supreme Court justices that have indicated that in this digital age, think about it, it's a lot different than 1975. That's when the last case, uh, Smith versus Maryland, was held on records. And it's also different. That was about one suspect's uh, phone tap. We're now talking about 300 million Americans' phones. So I think it's a big deal, and it is different than what we've ever had before. So I'm, I'm hoping that we will get all the way to the Supreme Court. Uh, so earlier you condemned uh, Director of National Intelligence, uh, James Clapper, for allegedly uh, lying in front of Congress. Uh, you said he's very explicitly uh, broken the law. Um, does that mean that you think he should be sent to prison? I think he should be, well, you don't get sent to prison until you're found guilty, so we should have a trial. He deserves a trial. Um, but the interesting thing is, is I'm not an outlier on this in the sense that I think seven uh, members of the Intelligence Committee or Judiciary Committee in the House have signed a letter saying the same thing. And I think it hurts us because we do have to rely on some things being secret. And it's an extraordinary power. It's in a power to capture people incarcerate people. It's even a power to kill people. So that power needs to be overseen and they have to be honest with us. If the people in charge of the intelligence community are not being honest to Congress and they're actually spying on Congress, I have grave doubts about everything they're telling me. So yeah, I think it is important. And one of the reasons I bring it up is that many of these people, they want to throw the book at Snowden. And I have mixed feelings what should happen, because I, I think you can't release secrets all the time. I mean, that would lead to chaos. But at the same time, I think he also wanted to reveal something he thought was unconstitutional. But for all the people that want to throw the book and the letter of the law at Snowden, I like the contrast. They don't want to do a thing. They're not a peep out of them for, for Clapper. So you, you're not really being consistent if you want to throw the book at Snowden, but you don't want to do a thing to Clapper. They both broke the law, technically, and then you have to decide what justice is. But yeah, I think Clapper should be tried for perjury. So you say you're asked this all the time, um, but we want to get it in here too. Uh, would you classify Edward Snowden as, on the one hand, a hero or a traitor? And to phrase that slightly differently, maybe, um, if there were another Edward Snowden out there, uh, would you encourage him to speak up? You know, I think the ultimate decision of hero or villain history is going to sort out. And I think there are pros and cons to a lot of it. And I know people have a strong feeling about it. I think that his intentions were good, but here's the problem. Let's say we have 400, 500 people here, and let's say you all are, you know, we're talking to you and you're the new recruits for the CIA or for the intelligence for our army. Should I tell all 500 of you, just decide when you think it's unconstitutional and just reveal secrets anytime? You could see how it could lead to chaos. But at the same time, I'm very upset about what our intelligence community is doing. We might not have ever known about it had Snowden not leaked it. Some say Snowden should have tried to become a whistleblower. I don't know if he did try or what the process is. But I think on the one hand, you have chaos. You know, Bradley Manning released 24 million pages. There's a chance that people could die from that. There's a chance that intelligence could get out, that it could endanger our agents. And I'm not against 
spying. I mean, we will have people gathering intelligence around the world, and I don't think that we can allow uh, willy-nilly indiscriminate uh, release of documents. But at the same time, I'm sympathetic to what was released because I think it's a real problem. So I have mixed feelings, is the bottom line. Um, so you posed a very interesting question during your address. Um, you asked uh, about potential uh, CIA spying on Senate uh, computers. Um, to quote you, if the CIA is spying on Congress, who exactly can or will stop them? Um, so what would be your answer to this question? Well, see, here's the interesting thing, and this is uh, worth everybody reading about. The way I understand it, and this is what Senator Feinstein said in her speech, they came across something. They were given access to the CIA computers by the CIA. The search engine was created by the CIA. They say, and this, I'm just going from what they're telling me, they say they found a report called the Panetta Review, which looked into some previous activities of the CIA, interrogation and detention, and they got it through the search engine. If that's true, the CIA then may have said, oh, whoops, <laughs> we didn't want you to read that, but think about that. If it was a mistake by the CIA, you can say, well, it was a mistake, but why should the CIA be allowed to withhold an internal review from the people overseeing the CIA? So that to me is the arrogance that they think they're in charge and it's too important to let members of Congress know about. Well, if your members of Congress don't know about it, the people you have some interaction with and can get rid of or elect, then who is in charge? You can't have people who are not elected in charge of your government. And that is really, I think, the very definition of tyranny. So this to me is a very important thing. And I also want to make the point that I'm not saying that any of these people are necessarily evil or that they have bad motives. I think a lot of them have good intentions. And maybe they're not even abusing their power at all. The danger, though, is allowing that much power to go unchecked and not have review by Congress. Um, so we obviously don't have all the information yet. Um, it's a recent scandal. But if these allegations of the CIA hacking into uh, Senate computers do prove to be true, then who do you think should be held responsible? Uh, would it be just CIA Director John Brennan or perhaps um, some official higher up in the federal government? Yeah, that's a good question. I'm not sure I know the answer. Brennan was approved about a year or two ago. That's when I was I actually did the filibuster was to his nomination. And um, so whether or not it's Brennan or someone who precedes him, but Brennan oversees it now and he's defending the program and saying it didn't happen. But here's the real direct question. There's some media here y'all need to ask is ask Brennan, what about the Panetta Review? Why should Congress not be allowed to read the Panetta Review of the CIA interrogation program? I mean, if I'm not allowed to look at it, and this is something you also need to realize, many of this, much of this that goes on in the Intelligence Committee, I'm not allowed to read, okay? The Intelligence Committee is allowed to read things I'm not allowed to read, and then the head of the Intelligence Committee is allowed to read some things that the rest of the Intelligence Committee isn't. Some of the revelations that have come forward have come forward, and the day before they came forward, the CIA calls up Senator Feinstein and Chaplin and says, oh, by the way, we've been collecting email for the last 10 years. It's going to be revealed tomorrow. You know, so we're really not in the loop on this stuff, and we're not overseeing it. They're doing what they want, and then when they get caught, they, they inform us, but that's not oversight, and that's not representative government. This is incredibly important, not just because of abuse that may be occurring, but because of abuse that could happen if someone took the reins of power and really wanted to use this for um, malevolent purposes. All right, so we have time for just one more question for this interview. Um, this is on sort of a different topic. Um, there has been pretty extensive media coverage of your recent visits to places that don't usually vote Republican, like students at Howard University. You mean like and, Berkeley? And, and, <laughs> and at UC Berkeley. <laughs> um, there has been quite a lot of speculation that these efforts constitute an attempt on your part uh, to broaden your personal appeal in anticipation of a 2016 presidential run. Um, how do you reply to these claims? Uh, <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Part of it might be that. Part of it might be that the Republican Party is 
I, I've said they have to either evolve, adapt, or die. You know, it's a pretty harsh thing. I think I was telling somebody the other day, remember Domino's finally admitted they had bad crust? <laughs> think Republican Party admitted, okay? Bad crust, we need a, we need a different kind of party. But I think some of... One of the things that really upset me in the last couple years was that we passed legislation, really done by Republicans and Democrats, frankly, that allows an American citizen to be indefinitely detained without a trial. And I had a conversation with another senator, and I said, does this mean an American citizen could be accused of a crime and sent to Guantanamo Bay with no trial, no lawyer? He said, yeah, they're dangerous. I said, well, kind of begs the question, doesn't it? Who gets to decide whether you're dangerous or not? The reason why I think this is important is many sort of libertarians, libertarian-leaning Republicans, people who believe in individual rights, this really bothers us. But I think it's a bigger audience than that because think about it. If you're African-American, Japanese-American, Jewish-American, Hispanic, have there ever been times when the government didn't treat you fairly? Have there ever been times when you said, you know what? The war on drugs has had a racial outcome. Three out of four people in prison are brown or black. So something's gone wrong. Maybe a candidate who would stand up and say, everybody deserves their day in court. The law should not have a racial outcome. Maybe then people would say, you know what? I always hated those Republicans and their, their crust sucks. But maybe there's some new Republicans. Maybe there'll be a new GOP. We'll see. Thank you. So we also have some questions from the audience. Oh, God. Uh, <laughs> uh, we uh, passed out no cards before, and you guys have submitted some questions. So I was going to read a few of them uh, to the senator. Uh, this actually relates to your last point. Uh, do you think the issues of privacy and civil liberties could be used to bridge the partisan divide in Congress? You know, yes. And I think there's also there's a, there's a right-left nexus on this. One of the persons I work most closely with in Washington on NSA, spying abuse, more oversight needed is Ron Wyden. Now, he and I don't agree on some economic liberty issues. You know, he's not so much for lower taxes or less regulations. But on this, we're almost in 100% agreement on some of these intelligence issues. I think it's a way you could actually get things done. That compromise isn't always splitting the difference, but compromise means meaning that your party label isn't as important as the issue is. So to me, I, I honestly would tell you whether this was a Republican or a Democrat president, I would give exactly the same speech. And I think Ron Wyden would too. I think he's an, an honest progressive. In fact, I ribbed some of the others by saying, whatever happened to the good liberals around here, all right? You know, because you can be, a, I think, even someone who isn't a progressive, be progressives who are honestly good or I think very good on civil liberties. In fact, the president was. When he was a senator, President Obama was much better on civil liberties than he is now. Uh, next question from the audience. <laughs> um, if elected president, how would you respond to the recent increase of executive power? I think one of the biggest problems in the last 100 years, not Republican, not Democrat, but last 100 years has been the increase in power of the executive. We have thousands of orders written by the executive. Um, Montesquieu wrote and said, you know, he was big on the separation of powers and the checks and balances. He said when the executive begins to legislate, that becomes a form of tyranny. The check and balance is that the executive, the president's not allowed to legislate, only the legislature can. But it's a messy process and you got to, you, everybody's got to just come to grips with that. It's a messy process and it's not easy. But that's why you have to convince people on the other side of the aisle to vote for your stuff. And it is also why we have so much contention over the health care plan. Not one Republican voted for it. Had there been some Republicans voting for it, or had the Democrats come a little bit to our side to have a discussion, I don't think we'd be having this big war in our country right now. So really, I think the way I look at issues is we don't have to agree on everything. We are probably a mixture of people from parties and, and all different walks of life here. And let's say we take 10 issues. We're not going to agree all on all 10. You know, we might agree on three out of ten. Why don't we work on the three out of ten issues we agree on rather than spend our whole time fighting around the seven out of ten? Uh, 
Next question from the audience.